Hi, it's Kate, and this is the second video of week four of Math 23. The question at hand, now that we've figured out how to find eigenvectors and eigenvalues of a given matrix, is to determine when is there an eigenbasis for the domain of a linear transformation. Now, first of all, you might be wondering why it's even useful to span the space that is the domain uh, with a basis of eigenvectors, but if you're interested in what happens when a matrix A acts on a vector repeatedly, like more than once, more than twice, more than five times, more than any number of times that would be a barrier to you doing it out by hand, it's really useful to be able to express a vector as a linear combination of eigenvectors because we so easily know what a matrix does to its eigenvectors and we can exploit linearity and we're able to determine exactly what the output will be, what that vector will map to by breaking it down into a linear combination of its eigenvectors, knowing exactly what the matrix does to its eigenvectors, and then summing those together, exploiting linearity to find the total output of when the input is this particular vector. So that's our motivation behind trying to find an eigenbasis. We'll talk about more useful uh, applications of eigenbases and when they're relevant at the end of this section, but that's sort of our motivation even at the beginning. So let's talk about this. We choose W successively to equal the first basis vector, standard basis vector, the second standard basis vector, and so on and so forth, all the way up to the nth standard basis vector. It depends on what the dimension is of your matrix. And so in the search for finding these eigenvectors, now that we've chosen these various W's, so to speak, we find all these different polynomials. And basically, there is a basis of real eigenvectors if and only if each of the polynomials in this list that we've created have, each one has simple real roots. Something that looks like this. There are no repeated factors and all the roots are real numbers. That's a really important statement to know. Here's an example of a polynomial that doesn't do that. So take a look at this one. A polynomial like this that says t squared plus 1, it doesn't have any repeated factors, but it has no real roots. So that's an example of what would not tell us that we have a basis of real eigenvectors. So if we allow for complex roots, then any polynomial can be factored into linear factors, which you can justify with the fundamental theorem of algebra and read more about in the Hubbard textbook. But most of the time, um, complex roots are not super helpful for us. Sometimes, depending on the application, we're really only interested in real answers. But sometimes they are. So occasionally you do care whether or not you can get a basis of complex eigenvectors. It depends on the application. But in this case, there is a basis of complex eigenvectors if and only if each of the polynomials has simple roots. doesn't matter that they're simple and real just simple is fine. So basically what we're looking for is there are just no repeated factors, and here's an example of that. One thing to note is that the, our technique that we use for finding these eigenvectors for matrices also works for matrices over finite fields, but it's also entirely possible for the polynomials that we get to not have any linear factors. So in that particular case, there would be no eigenvectors and no eigenbasis for a matrix. So that's one of the only instances that contradicts our usual approach where we say, oh, operations in finite fields are exactly the same as outside finite fields, or we get the same result in either case. Uh, that is not true in this particular case. Uh, linear algebra over a finite field in this case when we're looking for eigenvectors and eigenvalues is fundamentally different from when we're just doing linear algebra over either real or complex numbers. So let's take a look at matrix diagonalization. This is one of the interesting aspects of being able to use eigenbases. Matrix diagonalization comes into play when we have our best case scenario. So in our best case scenario, we can find a basis of n eigenvectors, v1 through vn, with associated eigenvalues. Uh, lambda 1 through lambda n, and although the eigenvectors must be linearly independent, uh, they are they form a basis altogether, the eigenvalues can repeat. So a single eigenvalue uh, can have more than one eigenvector associated with it. 
What we want to do is we want to create a matrix P whose columns are the eigenvectors. So P is going to look like this. And we note that since each of the eigenvectors is linearly independent from each other, this matrix is invertible. So there is an inverse P inverse that exists. So the matrix D, that is P inverse times the matrix A times P, is a diagonal matrix. Here's our proof of it. So D acting on E sub K, which is the kth standard basis vector, which if you remember, having a matrix act on a standard basis vector extracts that particular column uh, from the matrix. So this is saying the kth column of the matrix D is equal to, okay, D is supposed to be equal to P inverse AP. So we just have substituted in P inverse AP, and we know that matrix multiplication is associative, so it doesn't matter that we've grouped these together. We note that P acting on E sub K will extract the kth column of the matrix P. And the matrix P, each column is an eigenvector, so this is going to extract V sub K, where V sub K is the kth eigenvector located in the kth column. Now note that V sub K is an eigenvector of the matrix A, so A acting on V sub K will give us lambda K, where lambda K is the eigenvalue associated with the eigenvector V sub K. Lambda k is just a scalar, so that can be factored out. We have now p inverse v sub k. And note that um, what p did was that it took a standard basis vector, the kth standard basis vector, and mapped it to the kth eigenvector. p inverse is going to go backwards. It's going to go from the kth eigenvector and return the kth standard basis vector so at the very end, we have lambda k times e sub k, which remember that this is supposed to be the kth column of the matrix D and some scalar multiple of the, of the standard base, basis vector e sub k is zeros everywhere except for the scalar multiple in the kth position. And so you can imagine that if that's happening, in the first, in the second, in the third, in the fourth, all the way down to the nth column that you now have a diagonal matrix. The matrix A can be expressed as A equals PDP inverse. And one way of thinking about it is you could start with this, prove that for yourself, and then multiply by P inverse on the right, multiply by P on the left, and doing the same thing to D will end you up with that, but it'll have the identity on either side of A, so you'd end up with this. But doing it from scratch basically means that if A acting on V sub K is, is the, if A is the same as P, D, P inverse, then A acting on V sub K is the same as P, D, P inverse acting on V sub K. We know that A acting on V sub K, because V sub K is an eigenvector uh, for A, will return lambda K, V K. So we know that matrix multiplication is associative. We want to show that this results in lambda k v k. That would prove that PDP inverse is the same as A. So first we note that P inverse v sub k gives us E sub k. I explained that up in this step here. So now we have D acting on E sub k. We know that D is a diagonal matrix basically filled with the eigenvalues corresponding to the eigenvectors uh, in P. So D acting on E sub K is going to extract the kth column of D, which is a lambda K times E sub K. So the scalar multiple lambda K on the standard basis vector E sub K. And then lambda sub K is just pulled out front because that's a scalar. And we have P acting on E sub K and that's just saying, what is the kth column of P? Well, the kth column of P is just V sub K. And sure enough, P, D, P inverse acting on V sub K returns lambda K times V sub K. So P, D, P inverse is the same as the matrix A. Note that when we write down D, which is a diagonal matrix that has the lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4, all the way down to lambda N as... Uh, its entries, it's really easy to raise that to an integer power. So raising d to the kth power will just give us lambda 1 to the k, lambda 2 to the k, lambda 3 to the k. And the reason that that's so nice is because 
Like I said at the beginning, when we care about what happens when a particular matrix A acts on a vector many, many, many times, if that matrix is not a diagonal matrix, that gets really messy. There's no clean way of writing that in what we call closed form, which basically means without using ellipses or without using dot, 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 there's no concise algebraic way for us to state exactly what the kth power of an arbitrary matrix would be. But with if that matrix is a diagonal matrix, the kth power is really easy to write down, and this is how we do it. Note that we've noted that A is equal to this product, P, D, P inverse. And that is also easy to raise to a power. And that power, A, sub a to the K, is equal to P, D to the K, P inverse. And I would totally take this moment to prove that to you, but it will actually be proved by induction uh, in this class. So I'll hold off on that. But the same result can also be extended to K roots of matrices, where B is equal to A to the 1 over kth power means that B to the K equals A. But this is what's really important is that there's this new way. A is any arbitrary matrix. It doesn't have to be a diagonal matrix. It can be any arbitrary matrix. And what we're saying here is that if we want to raise it to the kth power, like a really, really high power, that's difficult to write down. But this, however, is not. We know that P is this matrix, V1, V2, V3, V4, all the way down. P inverse is easily computable if we have P, right? And in the middle, we have D to the K, which looks something like this. So what is fascinating here is that this rather impossible uh, power of a matrix, multiple, multiple iterations of this matrix transformation, uh, can now be written quite nicely here. And we'll have several examples of that in class. That's one of the benefits of having an eigenbasis.